The whole tradition of the Indians of North America, excepting those of the Northwest, California, and some of the Southwest, is contained in the cross inscribed in the circle. From the viewpoint of geometric symbolism, the circle corresponds to the sky, while the cross marks the four directions of space and the quarters of the universe. It also marks the vertical triad of Earth, Man, Sky, which puts the horizontal quarters on three levels. It can be said that the wisdom of the Red Indians is based on the Pythagorean numbers 4 and 3, the first being horizontal and the second vertical. Man is the center, both of the four horizontal directions of space and of the vertical trinity of the cosmic hierarchy. In the first respect, he is the intelligence in which the four quarters are reflected and united, and he is thus identified with the cosmic axis, the world tree. In the latter respect, he is identified with life and is mediator between the earth under his feet and the sky over his head. He is the Kalimet, or the sacred pipe, which unites all beings in a single prayer, while again, he is the central fire which marks the middle of the world. And still again, he is the ember in the calumet that transmutes the tobacco into smoke or earth into sky. Man is thus twice in the middle, first on the horizontal plane as intelligence and spokesman for all terrestrial creatures, and secondly on the vertical axis as mediator where earth and sky meet. It is true that other creatures participate in life, but man synthesizes them. He carries all life within himself and is the point at which life opens up and becomes spirit. The lower creatures do not only have this accidental aspect, which allows man to kill them and use them for nourishment, they also have an essential aspect, due to their concrete symbolism on the one hand and their anteriority on the other. Created before man, they can manifest something of the divine origin and it is this aspect which sometimes calls for their veneration. The Great Spirit readily manifests itself in the world of the Indians, through animals and plants, through the great phenomena of nature, such as the sun, the rock, the sky, or the earth. The Indian humbles himself before the whole of creation, because all visible things were created before him and, being older than he, deserve respect. But although the last of created things, Man is also the first, since he alone may know the Great Spirit. Every created object is important simply because of its connection with the divinity and its qualities. It is for this that every created object is Wakan, holy, and has a power according to the spiritual reality that it reflects. And every object is treated with respect, for the particular power it possesses can be transferred into man. To believe that God is the Son is certainly an altogether pagan error, and one that is quite foreign to Red Indian belief, but it is just as absurd to believe that the sun is simply a blazing mass, that in no way whatsoever is a god. We might express the idea like this, Wakan is whatever conforms to the great spirit, or a great mystery. Wakan is what enables us to apprehend directly divine reality. A man is Wakan when his soul manifests the divine, with the spontaneous evidence of the wonders of nature, the elements, the sun, lightning, the eagle. That is why cowardice, a kind of forsaking of one's personality, is the foremost sin, and that also explains the Indian's individualism. As to the knowledge of the Great Spirit, which man alone of all earthly creation may attain to, Black Elk, a medicine man of the Lakota, once defined it as follows. I am blind and do not see the things of this world, but when the light comes from above, it enlightens my heart and I can see, for the eye of my heart sees everything. The heart is a sanctuary at the center of which there is a little space, wherein the Great Spirit dwells and this is the eye. This is the eye of the Great Spirit, by which he sees all things and through which we see him. If the heart is not pure, the Great Spirit cannot be seen. And if you should die in this ignorance, your soul cannot return immediately to the Great Spirit, but it must be purified by wandering about in the world. In order to know the center of the heart where the Great Spirit dwells, you must be pure and good, and live in the manner that the Great Spirit taught us. 
The man who is pure thus contains the universe in the pocket of his heart. Metaphysically speaking, there are two possible relationships between the relative and the absolute, or between the world and God, between Maya and Atma, the Hindus would say, and these are on the one hand the relationship of analogy and on the other that of projection. The first is discontinuous, for nothing in the world could be part of God. The second is continuous, for every symbol is a projection of God. The first relationship is that of transcendence, and the second that of immanence. All metaphysics, whether Platonic, Vedantic, or other, is contained in these two relationships. If the Indians kill buffalo, it is because they know that in this respect the buffalo is not divine that it is a perishable creature like any other. If, on the contrary, they reconcile themselves with the buffalo through the rite of Calumet, thanking it for having furnished them with their subsistence, it is because they know that in this respect the animal is a projection of the immortal. The universe is considered only as it relates to God and nothing illustrates better the polysynthetic perspective than the verses of the Rig Veda in which the world is likened to a part of universal man, Purusha, the victim of the primordial sacrifice whence all beings originate. This world is not but Purusha. Three quarters of him rose aloft, one quarter of him spread in this world so as to pervade all beings, animate and inanimate.